We have a wonderful story today. Jeff Curry is back. Singing the words I think a lot of us want to hear, the commodity super cycle is not dead. It is simply delayed. And Jeff Curry, the former head of commodities at Goldman Sachs, is now saying expect a reversal. So I will get into that story. Hello and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. Something to look forward to in what looks like an incredibly volatile year ahead of us. But, you know, as terrifying as we could see it being with all of the geopolitical issues, of course, election in Taiwan on Saturday, by the way, pretty tight race, horse race, as they like to say, usually a month before the U.S. presidential elections, almost always. We'll see if it happens this year. All to say, it looks like a bit of a horse race there in Taiwan. Again, election on Saturday. Long anticipated. Hard to believe it's here. You'd actually think it would be getting more press. So that is happening. You have an interesting development in the Red Sea just before we get to Jeff Curry here. Of course, last week, I was mentioning how Maersk was aborting the mission and no longer going through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. But now there are even reports coming from my favorite YouTube channel right now, What is Going On in Shipping, which I highly recommend. Just pure information and facts on a very important subject. You're also getting reports of people from Somalia also attacking some of the ships as they divert around the Cape of Good Hope, around South Africa there. So I've only heard like one report of that, but it's quite interesting Because if that route gets cut off, then you really start to run into some serious problems. According to what is going on in shipping, this is not like Somali piracy, as we might remember from years back. This is actually thought to be in sympathy with the Palestinian cause. So not only are the Houthi attacking ships in the name of the Palestinians, the Somalis are also harassing supply chains and cargo ships along their coast. I mean, just one, you know, report from a pretty credible YouTube channel, I would say. So I wouldn't run away with it, but nevertheless, I'd say worth mentioning. So interesting events there. And of course, you have Blinken flying all over the Middle East right now. And so it is a very dynamic time. And so let's turn back now to Jeff Curry with what he is saying, because the point I want to make here is our supply chains, as we discovered in Panama, with the Cobre Panama mine being taken offline, you know, what is it, 1.5% or 2% of the copper supply being taken off? 400,000 tons of copper, and the surplus was expected to be 600,000 tons for 2024. That being taken offline within two or three months, you know, at very short notice. It seems to me that the world hangs by a thread, or at least it seems to me that the supply chains particularly the metal supply chains, hang by a thread. The Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, if you didn't hear, they had an election there too, and it is highly contested. Now, of course, the Ivanhoe Mines, Kamoa Kakula Mine is in the DRC. So all to say, maybe nothing happens there, but right now that story isn't going away. It seems like the supply chains, it it just feels more and more frail, shall we say. And again, election in Taiwan could be a flashpoint. And and just to illustrate what seems to me is the volatility of 2024, and it is terrifying and thrilling, I might add. You know, like, it's terrifying everything we see, right? And this American election, which is, I think, probably the wildest any of us have ever seen, I would maintain. Feel free to disagree. It's also thrilling. I have to say, like from a news perspective, it is a golden age. I mean, you go to the State Department website, you go to the White House website, you go to, you know, the G Captain, which has like, you know, just for example, which I learned from of the what is going on in shipping channel. Just to give you an example, of, it seems to me like when you watch that channel, you start to see that we're I don't see how we avoid an inflation problem. And we have low energy prices because shipping prices are going through the roof and insurance prices are going through the roof. And now Shanghai to Genoa in Italy, ancient port there, where actually the Black Death is thought to have actually entered Europe in 13, was it 1347, 1348? The route from, again, China to Europe, at least to Southern Europe in Genoa in Italy, 
It is 57% longer. It is 15 days longer. So this costs way more. And of course, the cost gets passed down to you and me, the consumers. So this shipping problem, again, it seems like inflation, like it does feel like we risk a repeat of the 70s here. And just a final point before we return to Jeff Curry. Uh, Not sure if you heard about this story, but it is quite something. Look at this headline, an alumina price panic. And of course, alumina and bauxite make aluminum. Alumina price panic, a sign of future aluminum volatility. An ominous headline here. This is Andy Holm at Reuters. And it says here, January 8th, the new year started with a bang in the Chinese alumina market. The Shanghai Futures Exchange price for the product that sits between bauxite and metal in the primary aluminum production chain jumped 30% over the last two weeks of December, peaking at a January 3rd high of 3,838 won per metric ton. The distant trigger for the supercharged rally was a December 18th explosion at an oil terminal in Conakry, the capital of Guinea. And we're going to have another story on Guinea. They're working on a major iron ore mine there. Uh, They've been working on it for decades, but we'll get to that in the news section. The capital of Guinea, which is a major bauxite supplier to China's alumina refineries. So look at how fast that happened. Again, you think of Cobre Panama, you know, first Quantum's mine that got shut down there, uh, at least until May, from what I understand, at minimum. And how fast did that happen? So it seems to me this metals supply chain, it all hangs by a thread. And what we see is more flare-ups all across the board here. I mean, the Middle East continues to flare up. And, you know, we're seeing headlines here that there is major concern of a regional war that this continues to grow, these risks here. So, again, a terrifying, but I have to say from a news perspective, the reason I say thrilling, it may sound in bad taste, but I think we have to embrace... The situation, put it this way, I think it's a positive way of dealing with this situation because otherwise we'll just put our head under the pillow and pray. For me, it's just a pragmatic approach, which is, you know, enjoy the fact, you know, that you are living in interesting times as the Chinese curse goes. You are living in interesting times. There is no question. So let's turn to Jeff Curry here just very quickly and hear the latest. Goldman veteran Jeff Curry remains bullish on commodities this year. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. And very quickly here, demand for raw materials is at record levels. Again, demand is at record levels. Inventories are low. And spare production capacity is largely, quote unquote, exhausted, the veteran analyst said in an interview with Bloomberg Television. If you go to mining.com, you can find this article, and there is a video of the entire interview, which I do recommend uh, for people that are wondering to themselves, like, what happened to this commodity super cycle? It doesn't seem to have materialized. Jeff Curry is saying, you know, be patient, expect a reversal. Because, of course, he's been saying this, and it's tempting to think perhaps he lost his job there. Who knows? He moved on last year. Because this thing has never materialized, and he's been talking very bullishly since 2021. So he may have run out of time there. Who knows? Pure speculation on my part. But I'm pretty sympathetic to his thesis. You know, as someone that reads the mining news here pretty closely, I'm very sympathetic. I mean, copper, which drifted sideways for much of 2023, has the greatest scope for gains, he added. You know, we see Robert Friedland out there, like we need at least double the copper price. And... You know, with all of the situation that's happening, I mean, copper remains below $4 a pound. What is it, $3.89, $3.89? So just to finish up here with Jeff Curry, quote, the setup for all these markets is better than it was last year, end quote. And if central banks proceed with interest rate cuts, quote, you're teeing yourself up for a fantastic 2024. This is just classic own commodities, end quote. So... Jeff Curry remains a bull. Now, we have a wonderful guest here today, the new president and CEO of AMEBC, Kimrit Jutla. I'm very pleased to welcome here, and Kimrit has a legal background, and Kimrit replaces Kendra Johnston. You might remember Kendra Johnston from previous years, so now the new executive director, president, and CEO of AME is Kimrit Jutla, and he previews 
their conference, but I also ask him before we go into the conference in the first half of the interview, what is his sense of natural resource development in Canada and in North America and just in general? What are the major factors at work? What are the you know, pain points, what can be improved. And so Kirit has a legal background. So he offers a very methodical, well-spoken perspective on what is happening. So a wonderful interview with Kirit Jutla. And he also discusses reconciliation, a major subject in Canadian mining. And I'm going to have Kirit back on in perhaps about six weeks here to discuss in depth developments on what is going on with reconciliation. So an introduction here and a preview of the great Association for Minerals and Exploration Roundup Conference coming up in January. So all the information you're going to want, just a buffet of information here, some wonderful news stories. Thank you once again, dear listener, for joining us. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on X at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, just a quick story on the BBC to set the table on deep sea mining, Norway to approve controversial deep sea mining. And this is Esme Stallard, climate and science reporter at BBC News. Norway is likely to become the first country in the world to move forward with the controversial practice of commercial scale deep sea mining. The plan, up before a parliamentary vote on Tuesday, will accelerate the hunt for precious metals which are in high demand for green technologies. Clearly not a mining reporter referring to precious metals as green technologies, but I understand. I think they mean literally they are precious metals. Environmental scientists have warned it could be devastating for marine life. The vote concerns Norwegian waters, but agreement on mining in international waters could also be reached this year. The vote is expected to pass without hindrance after it secured cross-party backing at the end of 2023. The Norwegian government said it was being cautious and would only begin issuing licenses once further environmental studies were carried out. And of course, they are referring to the nodules here. The deep sea hosts potato-sized rock called nodules and crusts, which contain minerals such as lithium, scandium, and cobalt, critical for clean technologies, including batteries. So just to set the table for this next story here on mining.com, this is a staff writer. Pentagon to deliver report on domestic seafloor mining by March. So it really is moving ahead here. I feel like this is also a preview of what could happen on the moon, this deep sea mining situation. Like I could see this being a prelude in terms of a narrative arc. Under the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, signed into law on January 3rd, U.S. President Joe Biden has directed the House Armed Services Committee to submit a report on the domestic processing of seafloor polymetallic nodules. The Pentagon will deliver a report assessing deep-sea mining by March 1st. So a developing story here. Last month, 31 members of Congress wrote a letter to the Secretary of Defense and the Pentagon urging the Department of Defense to, quote, explore every avenue to strengthen our rare earth and critical mineral supply chains, end quote, emphasizing, quote, the importance of evaluating and planning for seabed mining as a new vector of competition, end quote. In November 2023, a bipartisan coalition, I mean, not that long ago, a month and a half ago, a bipartisan coalition led by Senator Lisa Murkowski, Republican from Arkansas, reintroduced a resolution urging the U.S. Senate to ratify the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea. They argued that sitting out risks letting the rest of the world dictate maritime agendas from seabed mining to critical subsea infrastructure. The NDAA underscores the need to intensify efforts in response to foreign adversaries, especially China. And here's a quote from the document. Quote, in recent years, China has taken aggressive and brazen steps to secure and process seabed resources of polymetallic nodules into strategic planning for national security, end quote. And let's not forget that story from the last couple of weeks where the U.S. unilaterally just expanded its sovereignty over the deep sea floor quite significantly into the Arctic and off the west coast there, where there are thought to be a lot of critical minerals. 
And finally, quote, to counter China's growing hold on the global supply chain, it is essential that the United States secures its own innovative supply of critical and strategic minerals and materials, including polymetallic nodules, to decrease reliance on sources from foreign adversaries, end quote, members of Congress wrote. So watch this space continuing on. U.S. Supreme Court dismisses Alaska's bid to keep Pebble Project alive. Of course, as I like to call it here, Northern Dynasty, a soap opera here. I'd just call it the Mining World Soap Opera, Northern Dynasty. The U.S. Supreme Court on Monday dismissed Alaska's bid to keep the Pebble Mine Project alive after it was essentially shot down by the Environmental Protection Agency a year ago. It's interesting how it's going to the Supreme Court because I would think Alaska and Northern Dynasty would simply wait for the next Republican president, frankly, and just put it on ice until then. The proposed mine in the Bristle Bay area, which would have become the largest copper, gold, and molybdenum extraction site in North America, has met with nearly two decades of resistance for its potential impact on nature and the communities that depend on them. In January 2023, the EPA sided with the opposition groups by blocking Northern Dynasty Minerals, the project owner, from storing mine waste in the Bristle Bay watershed, home to the world's largest sockeye salmon fisheries. Alaskan lawmakers in support of the project filed in July a motion asking the Supreme Court to overturn the EPA decision, arguing that the nation's highest court had the authority to hear their case before lower courts reviewed the matter. And we have Steve Vladek, Supreme Court analyst and professor at the University of Texas School of Law, who told CNN, quote, Alaska tried to persuade the court that this is the rare kind of dispute that the justices should hear as a trial court without having to go through lower courts first. Although there's no explanation accompanying today's denial, it stands to reason that a majority of justices disagreed and were willing to let the case go through ordinary litigation in the lower courts first. So really, not even too much movement, just another episode in a weekly series that's been going on for over two decades. Continuing on, First Quantum said to be in talks with Zhang Ji over Zambian mines. Now, of course, First Quantum runs the Cobre Panama mine, or RAN, the Cobre Panama mine, so they're running into financial difficulties. This is Cecilia Jamasmi at Mining.com. Canadian miner, First Quantum Minerals, which is reeling from the forced closure of its flagship copper mine in Panama, is said to be in talks to sell a stake in its Zambian operations to help shore its finances. A person familiar with the matter told Reuters on Friday that Chinese state-owned Zhangxi Copper Corporation has already approached First Quantum on the matter, but that no agreement has been reached so far. The Vancouver-based miner is the sole owner of the Sentinel Copper Mine and has an 80% stake in the Kansanchi Mine, both in Zambia. Zhang Ji, First Quantum's top shareholder, is said to be evaluating the acquisition of one of the two mines or a stake in one of them, according to the report. First Quantum's presence in Zambia, Africa's second largest copper producer, also includes the Fishtai Copper Project near the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. So very interesting development there. And Chinese state-owned Jiangxi Copper, they're already, you know, the biggest shareholder in First Quantum. They want to buy it just outright, which is quite interesting. Continuing on, Samandu Build expected to start in 2024 after almost 30 years of setbacks. This is by a staff writer at Mining.com. Rio Tinto expects to begin infrastructure work on the massive Samandu Iron Ore Project in Guinea this year, following almost three decades of setbacks and scandals. Set to be the world's largest and high-grade new iron ore mine, the project will add around 5% to global seaborne supply when it comes online. 5% of global supply. It is a partnership between Rio Tinto, the Ghanaian government, and at least seven other companies, including five from China. Project developments require initial funding of about $11 billion, Rio Tinto said in December. Rio Tinto first secured an exploration license for Samandu in 1997. Since then, the country has experienced two coups d'etat, seen four heads of state, and undergone three presidential elections. In 2024, once the miners' state-owned Chinese partners receive the final approval from Beijing, Rio Tinto intends to commence its most complex project in history. Again, China deeply involved here. Quote, there is nothing else out there of this scale and size, end quote. Rio Tinto's head of the copper business, Bold Batar, told the Financial Times in an interview. So very interesting development there. And another development in Africa here, Ivanhoe. And again, I think China owns half of Ivanhoe from my understanding. 
Ivanhoe eyes higher copper output at Kamoa Kakula. Canada's Ivanhoe mines produced 393,000 tons of copper last year at its flagship Kamoa Kakula complex in the Democratic Republic of Congo, up 18% from 2022 levels, and it expects to churn out between 440,000 and 490,000 tons of metal this year. So remember Cobre Panama at 400,000 tons that were expected this year, which got taken off a line. So around the same scale here, even a little bigger. The targets for 2024 should be reached following the anticipated completion of the 5 million ton per annum phase three concentrator during the third quarter of 2024. Executive co-chair Robert Friedland and President Marna Kleet said in the statement, the news followed the announcement last week of the first shipment of copper concentrate from the DRC complex arriving to the port of Lobito in Angola. So interesting story there. And again, there was an election in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it is highly contested after the results of the re-election of the sitting president there by a landslide. So it'll be interesting to see how that story develops. Continuing on, Freeport Indonesia requests export ban exemption beyond May 2024. And again, this speaks to the whole idea that look at how many of these projects hang by a thread. There's Ivanhoe in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is experiencing pretty serious political turmoil right now. Here in Indonesia, Freeport is asking for an export ban exemption beyond May. So this is Reuters via mining.com. Miner Freeport Indonesia has requested it be allowed to continue shipping copper concentrate despite an export ban taking effect in June 2024. As the company's smelter will not reach full capacity before December, a company spokesperson said on Friday. The company's current export permit is valid only until the end of May, and while construction of the new smelter is expected to finish in May, it requires months to ramp up capacity, said Agung Laksamana. Interesting story there. And a couple of more here. Zimbabwe gold output declines 15% amid electricity forex shortages. This is Reuters via mining.com. This is a whole other issue that we haven't really thought about, which is if we start getting more global turmoil and supply chains start getting cut, you could get weird situations where, you know, Zimbabwe here, where these commodity producers' output starts to decline because of weird things like not getting enough electricity or not having enough forex. Let's just read a couple of paragraphs here. Zimbabwe produced 30 metric tons of gold in 2023, 15% less than the previous year, official data showed on Monday, as electricity cuts and currency volatility impacted output. Scrolling down a bit, output plunged to a mere three tons in 2008 at the height of Zimbabwe's political and hyperinflation crisis. Although production has recovered in recent years, reaching an all-time high of 35 tons in 2022, the country still lags behind its regional peers despite its significant potential. The country also experienced intensified power cuts due to the frequent breakdown of its aging coal-fired plants, while generation at the Kariba Hydro Power Station continues to be throttled by low water levels. Another major issue on the horizon here. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market just to get a gauge of the price of money. And the U.S. 10-year bond is yielding 4.021%. So back above 4%, about 0.06% higher than last week. U.K. 10-year gilts are yielding 3.77%. That is 0.11% higher than last week. And the Italy 10-year bond is at 3.82%. That is 0.06% higher than last week. So, interestingly, Italian bonds are yielding less than U.S. 10-year bonds. And let's turn to our precious metals. Gold is at $2,043.90 per ounce. That is $33 lower than last week. Silver is also lower at $23.36 per ounce. That is 80 cents lower than last week. Platinum is also lower at $944.68 per ounce. That is $66 lower than last week. And palladium 
is also lower at $992.61 per ounce. That is $127 lower than last week. Turning to our industrial metals, copper is $0.08 cents lower at $3.80 per pound. Iron ore is higher at $140.87 per metric ton. That is $4 higher than last week. Aluminum is $0.06 cents lower at $1.02 per pound. Lead is a penny higher at $0.93 cents per pound. Nickel is $0.10 cents lower at $7.33 per pound. Tin is also lower at $11.17 per pound. That is $0.36 cents lower than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $13.22 per pound. Lithium hitting a new low at $13.47 per kilogram. That is... 16 cents lower than last week. Uranium is unchanged at $91 per pound. And zinc is 7 cents lower at $1.14 per pound. Zooming out, it appears to me the real performer here is iron ore this week. And I think also uranium should be noticed as not going down while almost every other metal apart from iron ore was falling So likely a result of a stronger dollar, but you see where the relative strength is there again in iron ore and uranium, and those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome Kirit Jutla to the Northern Miner podcast for the very first time. He is executive director, president, and chief executive officer of the Association for Mineral Exploration, and he previews the AME Roundup Conference, a major event in the mining calendar, especially in Canada. It is his first year as AME BC president, and so I ask him about that. I ask him about the conference. I ask him about mining in BC and Canada and where it fits in the larger world. It is an absolutely fascinating discussion. I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome for the first time to the Northern Miner podcast, Kirit Jutla, President and CEO of the Association for Mineral Exploration. Kirit, welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you, Kirit. And I guess it must be your first year as the President and CEO of the Association for Mineral Exploration as last year, I remember Kendra Johnston was the person I interviewed. So is that the case? When did you start as president and CEO of AME? Yeah, I started in September of this year and um, had great support and want to really thank Kendra Johnson and the interim president after her, Jessica Vanderaker, who, you know, put a lot of great work into AME and have left a fantastic legacy and have provided great support to me in the new role. Yeah, I started in September of this year and it's been a fantastic three months, a very busy three months and looking forward to Roundup coming up later on this month. It's a constant here in the calendar every year, the AME BC, since I started at the Northern Miner over 10 years ago now. And so tell us, before we get into everything that is going to be taking place at AME, tell us a little bit about yourself. If you could introduce yourself to a certain degree to the audience, you might be new to a lot of people here. Tell us, how did you find yourself in this role and how did you get involved in mining? Sure. I've always been very passionate about the natural resource economy in Canada and especially how that economy can continue to grow and prosper while having, you know, a focus on reconciliation and environmental sustainability as key pillars. So that took me into, so I'm originally from Southern Ontario and uh, did a, an undergrad and master's out there in political science and economics as it relates to natural resource development and I was really passionate and really enjoyed the work and went to Alberta to do an MBA and law degree with a focus on natural resource development and indigenous law and Aboriginal law issues and was fortunate enough to work out there in the oil sands and oil and gas sector and practice law working for both proponents and nations. That brought me out to BC where I got more exposure to pipeline work and then mining and mineral exploration work. And 
the more I got into it, you know, not only in Ontario and across Canada, but especially in BC, the more I saw just how much of a key role mineral exploration would play in the future of not only BC's economy and Canada's economy and the geopolitical importance of, you know, critical minerals and mineral exploration, but always looking at, you know, how will it also provide a key driving role in reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada, environmental sustainability and how all parties, industry, government and uh, Indigenous peoples can come together and work together to find, you know, great solutions on that. So having practice in the area for quite some time, I didn't want to go down a partnership route in law and was thinking about what next and worked in government for two years with the BC government. So I worked at the Environmental Assessment Office and then at the uh, Ministry of Energy and Mines and really loved the work, especially in in mining and mineral exploration. And then this position opened up and I thought it would be a great opportunity to, you know, bring this holistic viewpoint and analytical framework to AME. So it's been a fantastic experience so far, high learning curve and I have been fortunate enough to go to many, you know, mine sites as well and really looking forward to doing more of that in the next year uh, with our members. It is a very interesting time in this industry, isn't it? I mean, I, again, like having been in it uh, for, I guess, 11 or 12 years now, I would say by far it is the most interesting time for the very reasons that you state, you know, the geopolitical importance, you know, all of a sudden, these minerals and mining is all of a sudden basically front and center of many of the governments around the world, not just in the West. You know, it is a global issue. So with that in mind, I mean, where are we right now in Canada or British Columbia? Where are we with mining in Canada and exploration? I mean, when I talk to people, say like Stephen Stewart, I hear, you know, permitting still takes a long time. Like, where are we from your perspective in the mining industry in this country? Yeah, that's a a really good question. I was fortunate enough to be in London last month for the Mines and Money Conference resourcing tomorrow. And I think it really highlighted the really important and I think the really integral role that Canada and especially British Columbia can play and will play in the future of the international critical mineral supply chain. Where we are currently in BC is I think we're on the cusp of an exciting era for mineral exploration in our province. We have proactive policies and collaborative processes that I think really set us apart ensuring that BC is not only competitive but leads in the global arena. So you know, in 2022, there was, you know, a record of $740 million invested in the province, right? So we're not just breaking ground, we're breaking records from previous 681 million in previous years, right? So I think we're in a good spot, but where things are really coming to, I think a good focal point and, and an interesting focal point here is how we continue to advance the key role and the importance of the industry in light of our responsibilities and our commitments to reconciliation and environmental sustainability. So, you know, the goal of our members is to make discoveries and test the project viability of becoming a mine in the future, right? And a viable project needs to ensure that it has economic feasibility, it has a low carbon footprint with minimal impact on the land, and a positive social impact and relationship with Indigenous peoples. I think a really key and important thing that we're working with right now is how the industry continues to move forward with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, and BC's enactment of the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, or DRIPA. And, you know, it's been an amazing experience to work with government and work with Indigenous groups on how the industry can continue consulting and engaging with Indigenous peoples early and often, and how we do it in a way that benefits all parties, right? That, you know, that really improves Indigenous relationships and reconciliation, implementing dynamic policymaking, and ensures that exploration is done that continues to foster and focus it as a a key source for research and development in the global mining industry. BC is a center of excellence with 
experience, knowledge, and geology to prove it. So where we're at right now is that really exciting opportunity to see how we can continue moving that forward. And I think really ensure that we can, you know, maximize and capitalize on this amazing window that is opened up for critical mineral importance for our partners all around the world. Fascinating. And do you see any like major stumbling blocks or is it something that we kind of just kind of iterate on all fronts, whether it is permitting, whether it is being, you know, fairer and just, you know, improving on the reconciliation front as an industry over the last several decades? I'm sure it's come a long way. Like, do you see any major stumbling blocks that are like, we need to focus on this especially or is it something that we're kind of iterating on all fronts and we're making progress? I mean, another way of framing the question is, are you optimistic on this situation? Mm -hmm. I'm very optimistic about it. An earlier point, a question that you had was about uh, permitting timelines and some of those issues there. We've seen here in BC permits actually going smoother and now and now faster through the through the process. And that's a huge credit to the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation and Minister Josie Osborne. So we've seen, you know, progress happening there. And I think key items that we're looking forward to continue to working with the provincial government on is the critical mineral strategy and what that will look like, right? Critical Minerals presents a generational opportunity for BC and Canada to be a leader in supplying the minerals for a low carbon future and how that contributes to high ESG standards. So you know, we're looking forward for the government to release their critical mineral strategy and, you know, optimistic that it'll be a really strong one for British Columbia. And the other item, I think, in terms of, you know, items that we're excited to look at and, and be a part of is the continued Indigenous engagement and, and reconciliation efforts. One of the items here is the modernization of the Mineral Tenure Act, which basically you know, governs how claim staking happens in the province. So uh, there's been a, a court case that has happened with respect to what consultation is applied to with that case and what the duty to consult is with respect to uh, o- online claim staking. And that's something we're really excited to continue to work with government on to ensure that processes like that are done in a way that respect Indigenous rights and the consultation duty, while also, you know, modernizing it in a way that ensures that the process is still effective. It's, uh, you know, fair for people who have claims currently in the system and also working with Indigenous peoples to ensure that it's done in a way that's respectful and fair. So, you know, those are some of those issues that that we're really looking at is how do we continue building processes, policies, and regulatory frameworks that respect Indigenous rights, traditions, and interests and land use decisions, while also being fair for all different parties who are currently involved in the industry so that everyone can benefit moving forward. And the key items for there is certainty, transparency, and efficiency in all of these processes moving forward so that, you know, as I mentioned before, benefits everyone. It advances government's goals, Indigenous people's goals, industry's goals, and ensures that we keep making BC the place to invest in both domestically and internationally for critical minerals. You know, when you say transparency, it it makes a lot of sense to me because it does really sound like the more I learn about these issues that explorers have and just mining companies in general, it really is like a political juggling act. I mean, there are so many stakeholders, so to speak, whether it's on a federal level, a provincial level, or even on a local level. I mean, there are a lot of people that you need to deal with. So in a sense, like it rings true. It sounds good to me in terms of like, If you're going to try and get all these people on board, as you say, it's almost like you need to have certain political values, let's say transparency, as you're saying, you know, otherwise, somewhere along the lines, if you don't have that, you might run into barriers. Absolutely. I think transparency, openness and ensuring that we have collaborative and respectful processes and dialogues that can bring all parties to the table so that we can build the best processes to move forward. Nothing is going to be, you know, without disagreement at times, but I think that's a key part of this collaborative process. And based on a lot of the work that I've done in in my career is how can we get all of these parties together 
separate almost like the the noise from the key signal and those issues and really ensure that we're focusing collectively on advancing all of these issues together in a collaborative way. You know, it's not a zero sum game. It's a positive sum game. And it's so important for all parties to be able to see where every other stakeholder is coming from. It's so important for you know, the industry and the industry has been a champion for reconciliation and economic reconciliation for decades, you know, providing capacity funding to Indigenous peoples at times when, you know, that wasn't there. But to continue showing and, and, and ensuring that the industry and I think people in BC understand why reconciliation is so important, understand why the legacy of of Indigenous peoples and the plight that um, indigenous peoples have had here in Canada and, and residential schools and and generational trauma, wh- why that is so important and how that relates to the importance in consultation and, and items with respect to natural resource development. But then also being able to understand you know, why other folks in the industry, be it prospectors or juniors who have been working in this for decades with limited budgets, you know, their perspective as well in terms of where they're coming from and, you know, the concerns they might have in the future with respect to potentially regulatory systems that would cause them to spend more money that they might not have, right? So seeing all of these parties come together and being able to truly express everyone's humanity to each other has been an amazing process to break down barriers, to have the conversations about how we develop a balanced process moving forward that will provide that transparency, certainty, and predictability moving forward. And that's something that I'm just so proud of and so honored to be a part of as BC being one of the first jurisdictions to really, you know, approach these topics like this. And I think that's going to make us stronger for it. It's going to make the province stronger for it and the industry stronger for it as a clear and true example of how ESG works in process. Shifting over somewhat then to AME, what role do you see the Association for Mineral Exploration playing in this bigger picture that we're discussing? Yeah. AME has had a an, a an amazing credit to you know those who come before me like Kendra Johnson and and Jessica Vanderaker and Edie Tom and Gavin Durham as well is AME has been an organization that has truly fostered collaborative discussion and Roundup is one of those great conferences that brings people together to be able to showcase not only the amazing work that. AME members are doing in the mineral exploration and mining space, but to also create spaces for Indigenous peoples, government and industry to have these type of conversations on how we can move forward. So AME, I think, has a great role in, you know, we work with government closely on many of these issues, you know, and then I think that sets us apart from many other uh, stakeholder groups is the strong collaborative relationship we have with governments and indigenous groups to be able to have these conversations. But also I think AME has a key role in continuing to champion our industry domestically and abroad. You know, producing the minerals and metals we need starts with discovering valuable deposits and the value here at home. And continuing to champion that message, continuing to showcase the people that are involved in the industry is something that AME has demonstrated time and time again to continue to break down some of those barriers. And I think the key thing that AME can do here is to continue to build a valuable legacy for generations to come in the mineral exploration and mining industry and to continue to, you know, be that voice of collaboration, but also, you know, fostering and championing good, uh, good policy and, and good processes in the industry moving forward. The AME Roundup Conference is a major event in the Canadian mining calendar, you know, right after PDAC there. I mean, I'd put AME Roundup there. So tell us this year, what do you have planned uh, for AME Roundup? What can we expect if we were to attend? What is going to happen at AME Roundup in 2024? 
Yeah, so Roundup 2024 is fast approaching. It's January 22nd and 25th. And the theme for Roundup this year is exploring for value. So, you know, some of those key items here is discovering the value in natural resources, driving economic value for local communities and regional economies. And so to my point earlier about, you know, showcasing and, and ensuring and, and and really bringing focus on all of the different entities that are in this big ecosystem of mineral exploration and mining, you know, building a valuable legacy for generations to come and realizing the value of BC as a global center of excellence in mining and mineral exploration, showcasing the points I discussed earlier, right? We define value differently. And at AME Roundup 2024, we're going to come together to examine all aspects of mineral exploration and development through technical, financial, and social lenses at Roundup leaders and economic geology, commodities and finance will be there to share the latest trends, tools and knowledge. And there's going to be moderated technical sessions and, and amazing speakers who are going to speak to it. And we have, you know, great participants and vendors who are going to be there. Right. So as I mentioned earlier in 2022, there was over $740 million invested in, in BC from over 450 vendors and 110 municipalities and indigenous nations across the province. So, you know, having these different people here at Roundup to showcase, you know, the suppliers and operators at every stage of mineral exploration and development supply chain, featuring grassroots prospectors, junior exploration companies and project generators, you know, on the cusp of something really big in, in the industry to major international mining companies. It, it's just going to be an amazing place to have all of these different people and voices together. The exhibit hall at AME is also going to feature service and supply companies essential to the mining economy and indigenous and government and academic groups there. So a big variety of folks across the, the sector here who can contribute to some great conversation. And lastly, to really highlight and continue to keep championing it as an event to continue to provide optimism and synergy and and I think a really strong outlook for a legacy to come down the road. So I think it's going to just demonstrate in action the strength of BC, the optimism that we all have moving forward and our ability to truly come together, collaborate and showcase the amazing potential that we have here in this province. It sounds like there's something there for almost all aspects of mining culture to a certain degree. Is that right? Like, I mean, it sounds like there's something for geologists, there's something for investors. I imagine there's talks on reconciliation. Is it basically, you know, in a sense, kind of a celebration of sorts, as well as an, you know, a analysis and discussion of, of the mining industry in BC, but also in Canada and even globally to a certain degree? Absolutely. You know, Roundup is one of the biggest conferences in uh, mineral exploration and mining. And it, it, absolutely, to your point, it, it it covers so much. And I think it, it's such a key driver and a key focus on not only mineral exploration and mining, but natural resource development is that things can't be siloed and looked at through one lens anymore. You have to be able to look at it through multiple lenses and be able to see it from so many different viewpoints, whether it's, you know, how does it impact the prospect or how does it impact the junior exploration company? How does it impact, you know, capital markets access, um, you know, to, to projects? How does it impact the supply chain for bigger companies? And how does that in turn impact our ability to be a key entity in the value chain and the geopolitical capital markets and, critical minerals economy, right? So it has something there for everyone. And actually, we, we have a, a discovery day as well for families and kids to be able to come in and learn about geology and such an important place to truly break down false perceptions about the industry and uh, to showcase all of the different people who are involved in it, who are building incredible reconciliation initiatives to showcase indigenous partnerships with mineral exploration and mining with many companies to showcase amazing advancements in geology and the study there and 
to have really good and poignant conversations about these issues. It's something I'm really excited to be part of as my first roundup. And as you said, it's a, I think that optimism and the ability to have everyone together and, and to have all these key stakeholders and have the BC government there as well is going to be something that's fantastic. So if you haven't got your pass yet to round up, please do. It's going to be a, a fantastic event. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear that you still have the kids portion or the family days, so to speak. So just on that point, actually, you know, because the education out there is crucial, I think, from the industry as well, because, of course, there's a lot of discussion of mining from outside of it. But it's also nice for the people who are actually doing it, uh, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, it's important for them to get their story out there, too, on what this industry is about. And so, OK, so let's get to the nuts and bolts of attending then. If someone wants to attend, how does one go about it? What are the different kind of options? How do you go to AME Roundup? Sure. Uh, so you can register online at roundup.amebc.ca, or if you Google Roundup 2024, it can take you to that page. And there you'll be able to see, you know, everything about Roundup to the schedule, to registration options that are available there, the different type of discounts available as well. So all of that information, you know, is available online. And the conference in itself, uh, you know, as I noted before, is, is, is three days with different events for all of the different stakeholders as well. The opening ceremony and keynote will be Monday, January 22nd with the closing ceremonies taking place on Thursday, January 25th. So in between then, you know, it, there's so many different events. There's so many different short courses that are being offered there as well. Networking session, exhibit halls, opportunities for students to come and network and liaise with companies for potential job opportunities. So all of that different type of registration information can be found online. And also we recommend for anyone to please don't hesitate to contact contact us at AME by email or on the phone for any questions on how they can attend or or different opportunities that exist to be a part of uh, AME and a part of Roundup. I'm really glad you mentioned the students because, uh, you know, it is a wonderful networking opportunity if you are graduating from, you know, geology school, so to speak, uh, with your geology degree in university. It's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it, to network and actually talk to the people who may have jobs available for students, uh, a lot of whom listen to this program. Absolutely. I think for students or anyone who's interested in the mineral exploration or mining industry and for the future is the the key future and, and focus for this industry is truly dependent upon the next generation of folks to to become and be part of the industry. And like I said before, a key part of breaking down, I think, false perceptions and narratives about the industry is just showcasing everything. Right. And all of us, it's not just being a geologist or just being a lawyer or just being someone involved in capital markets and government. Like we all need to be able to look at things holistically and to understand these things to all of us be part of solution development. And that's something so exciting in this industry moving forward in the future. So for any students listening, you know, we really encourage you to come out to to round up, to contact us and to join and be part of this uh, amazing industry moving forward. So just as we're wrapping up here then, Kirit, uh, do you have any final thoughts for us? It all sounds really, frankly, exciting. Thank you once again in the Northern Miner for chatting. I think for everyone listening is, you know, we're all in this together and we all can move forward together. And us being able to understand each other's perspectives, to be able to collectively discuss these issues and to be able to see each other's perspective will be so instrumental and key in all of us moving forward. So forward together, you know, round up exploring for value and just strong optimism for a wonderful future that's based and has the key pillars of Indigenous reconciliation, environmental sustainability and a strong critical minerals economy. We can all do this. We can all do this together. So this is at roundup.amebc.ca where you can get more information. And the conference is January 22nd to 25th. Kirit Jutla, President and CEO of the Association for Mineral Exploration. Thank you for joining us on this week's Northern Miner podcast. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the time.
you once again to Kirit Chutla. I look forward already to our next discussion where we're going to focus on reconciliation probably in late February there. So really looking forward to that. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And again, do check out the AME Roundup Conference if you're in mining and you are in British Columbia. It is well worth your while. And thank you, dear listener, for listening once again to the podcast. If you want to help us out, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.